In the early days of mountaineering, the pioneers were content to work their routes up snow slopes and glaciers in order to gain their summits. Soon they began to realize that in order to pursue their new sport more effectively, some skill in climbing rock was needed. So it was that numbers of climbers began to prepare themselves for their seasonal alpine forays by training on small crags and cliffs away from the big mountains. And slowly, the sport of rock climbing was born. A few hundred yards away from where I lived in Birmingham, there were fields and oak trees going down the borders of the fields. And basically, you tried to climb every one of them. The, the trees, trees are like roots. roots. There's, There's easy ones and hard ones. ones. And that was the post war mindset. We're talking about 1940s now, 48, 49. Remember, Everest was climbing in 53. And the, the role models that developed out of that a sense of Everest and that sense of exploration that welled up at that time. I think we can look back and say, yes, genuinely, those people were spurred on by the, the zeitgeist of the time. It was deeply ingrained in our psyche, like mother's milk. Why do you think climbing, why do you think climbing generates good stories? What is it about it? It's the adventure. If there's adventure involved, if, and I do shred that word if, and I don't regard a 200 foot high brick wall with bolts every five feet as adventure. That's gymnastics. It's not adventure. The architecture of the crag, the situation, the, the circumstances in which you find yourself there, out in the open air, open air, by its nature, it's intrinsically adventurous. Particularly if you've got to put your own gear in and you appear to be heading into nowhere. And that is just the sort of situation you feel in on a misty day on the roaches. And what makes a route like that special to a climber then? Why, does, why are those sort of routes important as a climber? To because those are the ones he remembers or she remembers because there's always roots of that ilk in their CV that they'll remember. And it may be that in this day and age, all they remember is some facile climbing wall competition result. But, I mean, my answer to that is don't kid yourself. One of my fellow scouts and I both went on a course in Kumidwal. We went with a, a seasoned guide called Scotty Dwyer, taking us up routes on Milestone Buttress and Gribbon Facet, and one route on the east face of, east face of Triffin. Well, looking back in hindsight, that was fantastically influential. Not only because both me and my mate had gone in, so we were able to combine to go and do things afterwards. And we introduced all our mates in the scouts to it. It was very much in the mindset, adventure, but not necessarily formalised sport. So camping, scouting, the, uh, the World Scout Jamboree, 1952 I think it was, Sutton Park, I went to that too, fantastic. Looking back now, it's all part of the subculture of the period, don't see any of it now. I would say that Hard Rock was a, a, a book version of the culture that I'd 
effectively imbibed in my magazine days. I'd got, I'd got together all the elements that could be used in road rock. Sub-editing, choice of route, choice of writer, uh, selection of route, juxtaposition of photographs, presentation of them. And the publisher got in touch with me, and Alan Brooke it was, and he said, um, do you fancy doing a book? And I said, I said, why have you rung me? He said, well, Don Willans, he said, we asked him, we've just done his memoirs, and they had, of course, Alec Ormerod, and he said, we asked him if he could do another book. And he said, no, 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 he says, why don't you get Wilson, he'll do your book. So, I can thank Don for um, that plug that got me in touch with Art Davis McGibbon in Soho, near Carnaby Street, next zeitgeist beginning to happen. Cenotaph Corner by Peter Crewe. Standing at Ponty Cromlech, the focal point of Clan Beres Pass, it seems as if you are completely surrounded by crags. Probably the most impressive on account of its steep and clean cut features is Dinas Cromlech, at the centre of which is a huge smooth corner. This is Cenotaph Corner, or THE Corner as it is most familiarly known to Welsh habituals, probably the best known climb in Wales, if not the whole of Britain. Since its first ascent by Joe Brown, Cenotaph Corner has occupied a unique place in Welsh climbing. Despite all the tremendous developments in climbing, Cenotaph still holds a certain mystery and fascination for climbers of all types. Even today, it is still regarded as the yardstick by which an up-and-coming young climber measures his progress. It is the ultimate ambition of the climber in his thirties who never quite made it. The corner must have had more ascents than any other climb of comparable grade. It has been climbed in rain, sleet and snow. This is the kind of treatment reserved for only the greatest of climbs. It is a paradox typical of climbing that a single pitch of 120 feet on a 200 feet crag is one of the most important routes in a major climbing area. Be stuck on any one. It's not ideal. That's not very big. Ugh, saved by the small hold at the top. Oh, sunshine. Could have done with that on the way up. Ah, oh, great. Oh, perfect. Well, not quite perfect, but... I don't know whether... I, I, I don't know because I'm not active anymore because of uh, dementia. Um, but my impression is that, uh, that although the hard climbs are getting done, they're being done by outstanding climbers. People who whatever climbing scene they were in, would be able to excel. Whereas the hard rock milieu is very much the ordinary man in the street getting themselves up to a point where they fancy that with a bit of good judgment and good technique, a little bit of inside knowledge before they go on the route, they can go and do the route and thereby have an adventure and arrive at the top of the cliff saying we are the champions which is what it's all about. Now, whether anybody get, arrives at the top of a sport route yelling, we are the champions, I don't know. They probably do. Uh, but I suspect it's um, a much more transient feeling of success. 
because there's going to be always going to be harder sport routes whereas only, there's only going to be one dream of white horses The Crack by Ken Wilson High above Langdale stands Gimmer Crack a 300 foot shoulder of rock proudly outlined on the edge of the Langdale Pikes The rock is hard and good, and the sunny south face is crisscrossed with roots steeped in the atmosphere of the twenties. One can imagine nail-booted felon rockers lurching their way up bracket and slab, and heaving painfully up the grotesquely desperate Amen corner. Gradually one moves back right to regain the crack, which is now hemmed in by a steep corner leading in one impressive sweep to the top of the crag. One long pitch, packed with exhilarating climbing, brings one to the top. A well-balanced and satisfying climb on excellent rock, the crack is rarely serious and never brutish. An elegant succession of interesting pitches makes it a climb for everyone. A succession of tricky moves and well-situated pitches builds up gradually, though never unpleasantly, to the final crux section. True to tradition, the crack reserves its climax to the end. Sated. The climber pulls over the top to relax on Gimmer's accommodating summit ledges. Yeah. How do you feel about the book now? It's lasted surprisingly well. The weakest book of the lot is Extreme Out, Extreme Rock, and the, 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 that's because of the the zeitgeist has gone. It's a different zeitgeist. Well, you know what the zeitgeist of Extreme Rock is. The assumption is that anybody who isn't sticking bolts in is out of date. Right, Unconquerable by Jim Perrin. In retrospect, Stanage is for me the focal point of that golden age we all once knew when we first came to the hills. A pastel sketched mood of mellow remembrance. The eastern seaboard of the peak, west facing over wave upon wave of moorland edge. Brown peat and purple heather, the rocks so softly red in evening sunlight filtered through the smoke haze of distant, unseen industry. So much beauty in those smoke-bruised sunset skies. Time passed when the rocks stood about unknown to us, and eager and lustful we explored their every intimacy, climbed until the failing light veiled the crags with shadow, our hands lacerated by the crystals of many a crack savagely fought. Early days, early struggles, our blood on the rock as an inextricable bond of friendship about which we built the flesh of our climbing career. The climbs are short and steep. Characteristically, they deal out inordinately large quantities of pain and fear. Torn hands, Scraped knees, strained arms, and a dry throat are all in a grit stoner's day. Oh, 
The top is rounded and frightening. You haul yourself over on flat hands in exultation. Oh dear. It's a bit wet. <laughs> bit wet at the top. Grit stone essence, living it fully over a few feet of rock. Let them never be so short. For me, there are no better climbs in the world. Once you've got a book out there, it's there forever. It's a statement in history, isn't it, sir, really? And to be able to do it is, is a privilege then it's pretty natural to um, go seeking after greater illumination of the, the world in which you lived. And trying to understand what, what crucial things contributed to it. Ed, Ed Drummond's a good case in point. Dementia is the combination of a physical and visual alleged connection. Can the hands and body interpret what the eye sees? And I can't trust myself to either to solo or to climb with normal gear. If I'm on the blunt end and the rope's going straight up, I can generally go through the motions up to a reasonable level. But that's not the point. So how's, how do you feel about that then now? I mean, not being able to climb? Well, all good things come to an end. Do you feel disappointed? No, on the contrary, I feel very privileged to have um, taken part in such a great period of climbing history. Oh, it's humbling. And how do you think it's, how do you think climbing's enriched your life? Well, I've made a living out of it. Just putting books together, lionising the activity that I, I've been describing to you, in terms of paper and photogra photographs, and titling, and stage managing. And I mean, also all these books are, it will be your legacy, you know, are, are you proud of that? Could be next year's chip paper, couldn't it? Who knows? Britain will never be one of the world's major climbing areas, but historical coincidence and isolation have given us an inheritance of small but rewarding climbs. It is a valuable inheritance from which thousands will gain years of exciting and absorbing recreation. Some have even made it the centre of their lives. <laughs> <laughs>